Yes, so um, uh, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, please introduce me, Ash Kumar. Uh, uh, he's visiting us from uh, CU, uh, uh, where he's uh, 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 running a group at the Robotics Institute. Um, uh, Vikash's uh, background is, is uh, he's coming from computer science. Uh, uh, his, uh, um, his PhD was uh, joined with uh, Emma Todorov, who some of us neuroscientists know, uh, uh, and who uh, his lab sort of created the Joko, which is the the, uh, uh, the physics simulation engine that uh, Roman uses for the fly-body model that, that, that we constructed. Um, and uh, jokingly also with uh, Sergey Levy, who's uh, 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 does a lot of robotics and uh, reports for learning. Uh, uh, and uh, he did a postdoc at, at Berkeley, at the at Berkeley AI lab. Uh, uh, and uh, since then, he sort of, uh, uh, I think, spent time at uh, all of the grades, which was an industrial research lab, starting with uh, um, uh, doing uh, uh, robotics at OpenAI, um, uh, and then uh, working Google uh, research, um, and, and most recently, Meta. Uh, uh, where over the last uh, two, two and a half years, he's been working on building a, uh, a, a musculoskeletal, a detailed anatomically realistic musculoskeletal model of the, uh, uh, of the human. Um, and in this case, uh, so far, I think I've seen a four, uh, you know, four arm and, and hand, but soon the whole body. I'll show you a glimpse of the whole body. Exactly. Um, and so it's super exciting work. And this is all of the work in Majoko. Um, you know, classically in biomechanics, people have been working um, with uh, more realistic sort of uh, uh, simulators. OpenSim is one of them, but these simulators are quite slow. Uh, Majoko goes fast, um, uh, uh, so the physics simulation is, is faster, which means that uh, it's fast enough to do reinforcement learning um, and, and uh, you know, maybe real time uh, model predictive control uh, as well. Uh, and so that, I think, puts us in a new uh, regime for biomechanics research. And, and so this is, I think, a very exciting time um, in, in, in this field. And uh, um, we're lucky to hear from one of the pioneers who's sort of uh, been with Mijoko since the beginning. Come on, yes. um, and, and I think we just heard someone on Zoom. So maybe uh, mute yourself and that's, uh, yes. Uh, but that, thank you. All right, thank you so much for the generous introduction, guys. It has been a pleasure visiting the campus. It's beautiful, and I'm excited to be here. Um, like uh, was mentioned, I'm a little bit from a different field, so I have a computational take to most of the things I'm going to say. Um, but at the same time, I will apologize in advance for butchering some of the neuroscientific or the biomechanical side of things, because that's what I'm trying to learn, and maybe you are more experts of, of those things. So. Pardon my ignorance over there, correct me if I'm wrong, but just go along with the line because I might find some boundaries and it might allow us to think a bit differently, right? And let me start like by the outrageous title that each one of you will be like, this is ridiculous and it's wrong. And I agree it's wrong, right? The brain definitely makes decisions, but the point of the title is that like, maybe for a split second, try to think, just try to think. Don't believe in it. Try to think that maybe brains do something different, right? And if I can take you in that journey today, maybe you'll try to appreciate, or maybe you'll learn to appreciate a little bit on different perspectives that what brain does and how it does it, etc. Right? So, not saying brain doesn't make decisions; it does. But just for a split second, try try to see it does more. Okay. All right. Let's. All right. So one. I want this talk to be more attractive. I don't care if I only go through five slides. So just stop me whenever you want. We'll go for a debate right there. All right, just to begin the conversation, uh, we'll go into intelligence a lot today. So maybe let's try to name five intelligent species. All right, anyone can raise their hand and say a name. Or maybe just yell out the name. Octopus. Octopus, yes, second. Humans. Humans, third. Mice. Mice, fourth. Dolphins. Fruit flies. Fruit flies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Common things between all of them. All of them have brains. Except octopus, which was interesting because it has 12 brains, not just one. Yeah, right. 
And this is an exercise. Do we have and if all of them move? They're capable of movement. Do we know of an organism that is able to move but does not have brain? Anyone? Jellyfish. Jellyfish. So fly trap. They are as well. So okay. So one key important thing I want to emphasize today is movement is quite complex, and brain does a lot of work to get to the movements, but there are also exceptions that movements are capable without brains as well. So we'll keep that in mind, okay? So my central pitch today is going to be intelligence, but in conjunction with the movements that the logical body enables or we are capable of, right? To begin with, the stance I'm gonna take is motor behavior is a readout of intelligence. The more intelligent you are, I think you are roughly capable of more articulate, more interesting motor behavior. Okay. Um, we have, I'm quoting Daniel Wolpert over here. They, he goes to a level where he says that humans have brain for one and only one reason, which is to produce adaptable and complex movements. And if we are not moving, there's no reason to have a brain. Like he goes to this level, which is pretty extreme, but it is a very, very positional statement that brain is very fundamental to movements. So in this talk, I'm going to basically take two stands on intelligence. One is about decision-making, brain makes decisions. And the second is about motor control, that the brain is actually responsible for motor control. And this is where the motor intelligence kicks in. And the first is where the cognitive intelligence kicks in. The first point is very well understood today. I think machine learning, generally the field of AI, is all about cognitive intelligence, cognitive decision making, and we are all hell bent on trying to make sure that we can do something like human, we can do better than human. The more novel thing over here that probably I'm clubbing together is the motor control aspect of things. If you talk to Boston Dynamics uh, co-founder Mark Rayburn, he would say athletic intelligence is the word that he uses a lot, right? So we are clubbing cognitive intelligence and athletic intelligence together, and together I'm going to call that these are two facets of intelligence, and if we can replicate that, then we probably have learned something along the way, all right? So why is motor intelligence so interesting, right? And why it is so hard or interesting for us to understand how brain handles this thing. First and foremost, it's overactuated. I do not know why the hell our body is so complicated. Can it not be just like one joint and one muscle and you're done with it? No, it's not. Why? We, there are over 600 muscles, 200 plus joints. Maybe people who know this better, number is even higher than that, right? Uh, we are multi-articular, multiple muscles go through each one of the joints. Again, like you know, thought robots are simpler, one more, one joint works. No. Uh, evolution did not converge on the solution. Unclear why. Uh, multi-joint system. There are multiple joints per muscle groups. And finally, it's a pull-only system, you cannot push. So the complexity of these biomechanical models are very, very high. And so now that begs the question is like, did we actually indeed make the life of a brain harder by making all of these complications or they do have some role? Otherwise it would be stupid to make like brains life harder and harder by making these things more and more complex, right? All right, so the goal that I get up to do and I want to achieve is to achieve human level dexterity and agility in physiological use tool tools. Okay. The key aspect is dexterity, because hands are one of the most complex and most articulate things that we know of. And if we can replicate some of the dexterity of the hands, then we have uncovered some fundamental principles. Agility, because we are capable of quick, nimble, reflective movement, and we are able to adjust and adapt in real time, right? How do we do this? And in order to understand those questions, what is key for me is to get to something that I call a physiological digital twin. Digital twin is a word which is very commonly used in uh, computer science. It's 
you want to replicate things, but I'm adding this logical in front of it because now I want to make sure that whatever I build, I understand. Maybe there is an embed embedding in physiology so that the lessons are actually transferable to health, maybe rehab, and we know something more about ourselves as well. Okay. All right. So first thing is to build physiological digital twins. We went out there, tried to look what existed. There's nothing that is satisfactory, so we still something that we call Biosuite. Biosuite is a fast and physiologically realistic framework that is that will support musculoskeletal as well as exoskeletal studies. So it's just a framework. It's a passive framework that is more capable in certain things that we want to do, which is study behavior. There is OpenSIM, which is also uh, a similar kind of uh, platform. And we are heavily inspired by OpenSIM. I think most of you might be familiar with. Those are more meant for, uh, I would say, studies on design of anatomy. Uh, they are very well suited for that. In contrast, where we will be very well suited for is for the functional studies of the same uh, musculoskeletal models. So they are very really complementary to each other and work together in different aspects of things. And go into those more details one on one or later if someone is more interested in it. Okay, so let's dig in. What is MyoSuite? MyoSuite is a musculoskeletal modeling software, which is around 4,000 times faster than any state of the art out there. Okay, so it's incredibly fast. That, you can, that means you can run very computationally intensive optimization groups on that. One thing. Second is it doesn't only support muscle dynamics, it supports full inertial and contact dynamics. That means you can do much more than just posing studies. You can do much more than the locomotion studies. You can do interactive behaviors with the surroundings. You can interact with the surroundings. You can interact with, you know, food pallets. You can interact with like muscle groups that are doing jugglings, etc. So contract with systems and it support full inertial dynamics. That means you can club them with exoskeleton and you can do exoskeleton studies. So you have fused hybrid systems, which are both biomechanical and robotic systems coming in together. And the combination of these two is what allows us to now go into physiological behaviors. So we have embedded machine learning algorithms that you can leverage to now get to physiological behaviors. And once you have behaviors, now you can get into how they're manifested. And that's what we are going to go through for today. Okay. So the physiological behavior that you see on the right is something called body balls. It's like two spheres that you rotate from the palm of your hand. It's very well known rehabilitation studies as a manipulation of one object was hard, not hard enough. We are going for like simultaneous rotation of two body balls. And I think you can do things like this and we can go a little bit more. Yes. Um, so the simulation. It's so a simulation. The, uh, you mean that's a CPU computer. Oh, it is it is of CP, but you can. Uh, I asked what's the secret for the speed up. <laughs> the speed secret for the speed up is we have a different parameterization of the hill type muscle model, so that's one. And the second is Majoko is written in a for computational pipelines. So from the get go, the way we wrote Majoko is to accelerate things. So Majoko by itself is quite a bit more efficient and faster than any other simulation software as well. All right, any other questions? Perfect. All right, so let's get started with introducing some of the models we have so far. All right, so the first model that you will see is an elbow model, it's a six muscle model uh, with just one joint. And the second one I'm showing is a myo plus exo, so the el uh, elbow with the exoskeleton with one degree of freedom. And the one I'm showing on the right is the myo hand, it's a 39 muscle model that we will see much more of in granular details. Um, I'm wondering about for the hand model, what the level of fidelity is and what you actually need to model. Mm -hmm. Like, I rock high and you have like pulleys on your fingers. Yeah. Yeah. I know that if you need to model every single tendon in order to explain the dynamics of the muscles, or if you can go more simple. Right. Okay, that is an excellent question. And there are multiple layers of it. Okay. So, any physics simulation, let alone musculoskeletal or not, we have a choice of what level of fidelity you want to go into. If you want to be computationally efficient, then you are going to take first order approximation to the level of what those things can be supported in real time. And if you really want, like, you know, each one of the granular details of bending and movements, then you can do like FEA analysis all the way over there. 
So what we are going to be talking about today is much more real-time computational emission systems. So we take rigid body dynamics as assumptions, and there are soft contact models in each one of them. So things don't deform and bend, but they're soft that we can pass in them. Right? Each one of the constraints are going to be softly imposed. So each of the joints are something that you can push on and you can control the complexity of these. Right. So they, the joints over there are going to be roughly head joints, ball joints, uh, things like that. The muscles are actually going to be uh, controlled using geometric constraints as well as wrapping objects. There are skin surfaces on each one of them to simulate soft tissues, and there will be deformation models on them as well, so that you can have like these, these soft contacts. Okay, so it's not just to say the muscle is here and it is constrained to that it touches here, the bone and the muscle are connected. The bone and muscle are connected. So you will see actually like much more details that muscle groups actually go out to the bones, come to all of them, and go all the way to the top and go through each one of them. So I mean, it's not a good example, but you'll see all of these things going through, turning around, all the way to the top, right? And we'll show skin surfaces later as well. Okay. All right. So we are. Yeah, we need to uh, anyone knows how to connect these over the need a I mean, like my internet is connected. Turn around, turn around, turn So that's the internet I was given, and it's disconnected. It's working fine to know. All right, sorry about that. Okay, so the second model I'm showing you over here is the lower body models. And here you can see the skin surfaces kind of like in translucent, and you can see the skin contacts also like to the ground. So here's the collection of models that is out there publicly available right now. It's my head and the my legs, which is on the video for the models. Right. And we can go more into the details of each one of them if anyone is interested. Okay. So now I've been promising functional study and functional tasks, and that's what we are going to go into. Is a set of a few collection of tasks that we are going to study. Things like simple reaching, which is classical, floating things, walking around different ways, uh, bending elbows, uh, the exoskeletons, etc., and some of the interesting ones like twirling a pen, rotating body balls, etc. Okay, so let me just show you the final results. So we can do things like partial control. What you see over like highlighted, each one of them is the muscle activation patterns in, in each one of these muscles. And we try to more times. Okay, to the key rotation task, maybe you have to coordinate index and thumb together in order to coordinate. And finally, you have like a uh, pen twirling task where the goal is shown on the far right. And then like the, the, the algorithms actually figured out what should be the body patterns in order to like position the, the pen. So these are, now we are going from what we could do in previous studies, partial control, and now we are moving more and more towards much more uh, contacted systems where we can control not only just the musculoskeletal dynamics, but actually the contact and inertial dynamics of external systems that, that have an effect back on the body. Right. So now uh, I, I took a leap of faith right now. I'm not going to go into details of this because I want to cover something much more interesting is I didn't tell you that like how I generated those results. Okay. So just assume that like you know some known optimizer or enforcement learning is able to do that, and that's good enough assumption to move forward. But if someone is more interested in knowing how we can do things like this, I'm happy to go into this offline. Uh, right. But it's not straightforward to get these systems to work. Uh, because they are fairly high dimensional system, they are third order systems, so optimization is not as fine. Okay, but let's just say that we know how to do it. Here is what happens, right? If we give it a fixed target that I ask to do exactly the thing that I, I want, I want to do each there, each there. We can solve these systems mostly 100% of the time. But if we actually ask you any kind of generalization, like reach over there, reach over there, maybe different kind of things, 
we saw there was a big generalization. Okay. Sorry, so um, there's there's two uh, scales of which you could sort of uh, measure success. Mm -hmm. One might be, um, did you succeed in sort of hitting that target? Yeah, right. And the second is, did you do it in the same way that a human did? Right. Uh, which of these are you uh, talking about here? The first one. Did you achieve the objective or not? Right now, we are not talking about at least in the scope of this work, did you do it like a human did or not? Okay. Okay. And, 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 and uh, um, so I guess I'm, I'm curious. Uh, you can do it with a pure sort of skeletal model without the muscles. Yes. Uh, and you can do it with the, where you directly actuate the joints. Correct. And then you can do it with the with the muscles. Correct. Um, uh, how much harder is it doing is, 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 is using muscles versus directly actuating the joints? Fair, fair, fair. Is, is that where the uh, a lot of the complexity comes in? Or yeah, so it basically makes the optimization landscape very nasty. Because now you're controlling third order dynamics. It's not zero centered because you have pull only system. So the exploration is kind of like biased in one direction always. And you start to hit and slide on the constraint manifold quite a bit. Right? So the optimization becomes really nasty. And the second is one to one actuation between joint and torque actuator is also very simple and nice. But when you have transmission that has moment on multiple joints, and the optimizers get confused about like, hey, where is the progress? When is the signal of the progress? So there's lots of those correlations. Um, so are you selling everything that's just one kind of network, or do you have a like a first layer of simple movement and second layer of all directed? This is this is all a black box single network solving. The, the so far what I've shown is all black box, and these networks are relatively small, two layer sixty four sixty four. So nothing complicated. Yes. So it's a separate network for each task, or separate network for each task. Yes. Back there. Um, there's many ways you could actuate to to get the desired response. Right. What metric do you use to choose among those? So this is pure exploration driven optimization we are doing. So we are just letting the optimizer freely choose what you are going to do to achieve the objective I'm going for. And then it's a question later: Was that is logical enough, realistic enough? No, that question is still open. Right. Solutions again. Exactly. Okay. Automation sensory feedback is allowed in this uh, whatever hue is capable of. Proprioceptive, Proprioceptive feedback, exterior receptive feedback. We are giving a position of the goal because we are not dealing with vision. So we are just whatever the visual input should tell you, we just give it as the statement. So we do have a system. Yes, we have yes, we have. Correct. We have skin. The skin has six degree of freedom contacts, normal contacts, sliding contacts, rolling contacts, and torsional contacts. So they can even sense friction. So you grab a number. Correct. They can sense friction, but in this case, I don't think we are giving the network uh, friction information. We are only giving the normal forces. And with just normal forces, they are okay. But we can also give the friction forces. What about proprioception? Proprioception, they know the tendon length and tendon activation and tendon velocities. No joint information. Okay. All right. So the key message over here is that so far, the agents that we are able to train are task oriented. If you give it exactly the task that you are going after, they do incredibly well. But they are not as general agents as we humans are, and that is the definition of intelligence, right? You are not puppeteering yourself to what you already know, but you are able to take the information that you have, and you can reuse them in newer systems, in newer surroundings. And that's what we found is that, like, okay, these are very dumb systems because they cannot generalize. And then we also ask, like, maybe we are dumb. Maybe these systems are good and we don't know how to optimize. So what we did, we threw a competition in the RIPS. This is the biggest machine learning conference. And we asked people that like, hey, can you design agents that can generalize? And we asked them to solve two tasks. One is dilatation, and second is the bounding balls. And we actually have some evaluation criteria, which is success versus plus how much effort we're using through that, which is like muscle effort. And even after this particular competition, which was one of the most successful competition in NeurIPS, was very well attended, like 40 part teams, 300 plus submissions, et cetera, very well attended. So this is not that like people didn't take time and effort to solve it. Even that, 
after that, the generalization gap is pretty huge. So, so far, the key message over here is we have agents that know how to solve the task, but we do not have agents yet that is intelligent, that able to take the experiences from previous lessons and reuse them in new settings. And that's what the intelligence is more about. So let me show you some of these solutions. They're pretty incredible. Like you can sort of see that they have understood like the basic tasks. I'm showing you like some success examples, some failure examples, and there are different level of generalization in terms of the size being different, the friction being different, the weight being different, et cetera, et cetera, right? And on the bottom is about ball. Like you can already see the size of this spheres are different. So as you ask them for generalization, they just leave the tree, nothing off of it all, right? There's a large gap in there. And this is what the rest of the talk is going to be about, which is a um, good half of the part. That now we are going to be actually going to look into generalization. So, so far in the timeline where we are, pre minus week era, we were doing quite well with simplified models. We were doing good postural control, force control kind of behaviors. But these models were slow and then were limited to what we call postural control because scaling them beyond those was really, really hard. What we did was introduce MyoSuite, which is hyper efficient model with full rich contact dynamics. And we figured out how to solve contact rich tasks. But then we realized that, like these, these agents that we have recovered so far, are more puppeteer agents or task agents, but they are not like general agents or intelligent agents like humans are. So the goal of the MyoSuite 2.0, which is about to get released in some time, is that we want to go towards general agent. We want to go towards agent that have skilled strand and task solutions. And they repurpose these skills for new or newer things, unknown things, etc. Right? Yeah. Yes. So you know these these models. You know, there's the anatomy, mm -hmm. and then there's the dynamics. Correct. Right. So how um, how good is your system identification for the dynamical parameters? Right. In in, uh, in this model. So the way we actually uh, build our models, there are four step process. One is we need to source where the data is coming from. And this is where I think you guys are incredible at. For us, we are limited to what OpenSIN has as the ground fruit. So we source most of our information from ground fruit. We convert, first step is geometric conversion. Just geometry should match and we are 100% uh, able to replicate OpenSIN. The second thing is that we go and we try to match the moment arm of each one of these muscles. We can match that 100%. The third is the dynamical properties of the muscles that we try to match between OpenSIM and what we have. And we can roughly match 99%, 98%, something like that, because we have difference in parameterization. So 1% comes from that. Now, the fourth is the most tricky step. And 80% of our time is spent on the fourth step. Fourth step. Because OpenSIM models so far has been only used for postural control. When you try to embed them in dynamic tasks, they would have so much issues they get stuck, the inertial properties are not right, the soft bodies are not done right. So most of our time actually goes into building from that mark forward, where we actually look at other data, okay, what is the inertial dynamics? What is the weight of these segments? What should be the skin surfaces? What should the deformation model for each other? So that's the most of the majority of the work. And, and even the parts that, that um, you are able to correctly replicate from open stuff, yeah. how accurate is that model in person? I uh, mean, like accuracy in terms of open sim being the gold standard, I would say probably 98 percent, 95 to 98%, I would say. But I think we also have to take it by a grain of salt because open sim is an approximation of the underlying data, right? Yeah. So open sim. That's like, what I'm wondering. Like, how, how good a model is open sim of the biology itself? Not good. Yeah, so you, okay. We struggle quite. So you would probably want to optimize everything. Yeah, that's just what the fourth step is basically. A, so third and fourth step is a big optimization problem that you optimize the whole model like from scratch, right? Yeah. So, but like, yeah, OpenSIM is considered gold standard and I'm not questioning it, but even replicating the gold standard that like, takes us only 20% mark of what we are actually after. So developing each one of the models is like multi-month effort that, that goes on. Other questions? Yeah. If I had another organism I was interested in, if I was interested in another organism, like yeah. a cephalopod or a bird or something, how much work is it to even get to this biophysical model? Is it, I don't know, are the parts modular enough that it's, it's uh, within a year, or is this multi-year long effort in experimental studies and measurements of skin? Or 
So there are two parts of this. Actually, we were going into this in the morning. There are two parts of it. If the data is perfect that we want, what we need, I would say that's not perfect. But usually what we have found is it's an iterative process of when the data is available, we start modeling it only to realize some data is not accurate enough or maybe some more data is needed or something is not captured and then go back. So the iterative loop is what came takes a lot, a lot of time for us. So the hand model roughly took around, that was the one of the first one to convince ourselves that like, okay, it's even impossible. Roughly, I would say six months, seven months, but we took elbow models, two, three weeks because they're simple system. Leg models took us around three months or so. So that's building from open source. That is building from open source. So how long did it take open source to build that model? I assume a lot of work because yes. data modeling, et cetera. So yeah, like we are leveraging and standing on the ground that others have created, right? And we're just like leveraging whatever they have and then going forward with it. Um, yeah, but like mostly it's a game of data at this point. If, if we have good data, we have converters ready that can buy it up quickly. We have like, you know, if OpenSim model exists, we can just convert that thing and then run the whole optimization ourselves. Okay, so like if I had a new organism, I would get 3D scan each of the bones and add them up and things yeah. like that and attach all the muscles manually first. Yeah. So I don't think you need the full 3D model, just the position information is enough. Like I don't think that detailed, but most of the detail is the dynamics model actually. Uh, getting the muscle dynamics right and the joint dynamics right, soft uh, tissues right. I think that's where the data usually is hard to get. Uh, and, and getting those things right is the tricky part. Geometry is, is reasonably easy. Okay. All right, moving forward. All right, so the next thing we're going to go for is skills and behavior so that we can start generalizing. Okay, so here is a small exercise I'm going to go through, and let's see, I want, I want everyone's participation. That the goal is to dress up, and the question is, would you rather dress up using the left or the right? Anyone on the left side? Well, everyone else has to raise their hand for the right in that case, right? Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay. I'm, I'm with you guys, right? Okay, one more time. All right. I mean, not all for the great cook, but like, let's just say you have to make this brilliant salad. You would you rather start on the left or you still start on the right? Right side, right side. Anyone left? Oh, we have some true cooks down there. I knew there a couple of them. All right, sounds good. So, question is what just happened here? I, I played a trick with you guys, okay? And basically, what I said is there is something that is helping us make easier decisions if you're here rather than over here, right? And what is going on is everything starts here and way before this. Humanity has worked its way to present things to us in these formats so that our life becomes easier, right? I'm not starting from farming to get there. I'm starting halfway there. And this is what community does. This is what Ramon does. This is what your parents do. This is what is generation. Generationally, the information has been passed on. You know, you don't discover a recipe. Someone told you, your mom, your dad, my mom, your dad, you read it somewhere, right? So there's a lot that goes into giving us basic bare bones in order to succeed. But if we ask what we are actually asking our agents to do, we are asking them, giving them like maybe molecules and then asking them to. So that's too much of that. That's crazy, right? So what is happening over here? Like, this is the step that we are missing mostly when we talk about intelligence, and that's the step I'm going to try to emulate. Okay, so what happens when you start from scratch? It's what we call paradox of choice. There's just too much going on. We have too much options to do, and it rather than making us happy because we have too much, it just confuses us. And this is run in like shopping malls, uh, all of these online shopping places is a well-known phenomenon. If you show too much people, they get confused, they don't buy anything. Show little things and they're very happy and easy. So the point here is we need to stop overwhelming our models when we are actually asking them to make decisions. And if you can do that, then potentially they are capable of way more things. Okay. So the, what I'm going to do now is scratch this understanding. Or like maybe positional sense that like brain makes decisions. Okay, this is where I want you to take a leap of faith with me. That do not think that the brain's role is to make decisions. Think that the brain's role is to build and update representations. Okay, 
present things not as a cluster of mess, but present things in a nicely organized way. That's what brain does for us. And if you can do that, then the intelligence emerges from this nice organized place rather than a place of chaos, right? That's what we are going to go with. All right, so a little bit of a math. Uh, this is going only on Matthew's slide. Uh, follow along if you care. You can sleep if you don't. But here is what we call an MVP. Uh, and people familiar with MVP, more of decision processes. Okay, okay. Some formulation when you say that current state, the next state of the world, here is the goal I want to go to, here's the word you're going to get, and here is the action that I take in order to do that. Okay, some math doesn't matter, but point is this is all less organized, or not organized at all. Think of like receptors filing everything like you know raw. Instead of taking this view of the world, we are going to take a view of the world where I'm going to add a representation in front of everyone, right? So it's organized way of seeing the world in rather than like, you know, my, my receptor sliding on the eyes, et cetera. So everything becomes a representation. The first thing is, I think this is where you can just like completely ignore these names, but if you're familiar with them, these are foundation models built on these particular sensory inputs. RPM, RRL, PDR. So these are in machine learning some of the foundation models that we have built on the raw sensory signals. The next is the transition dynamics of the system. It's like how does the state evolve from today to the next step? And there are some model based model algorithms over there that we have built together. The next is how do we understand what the goal is? Am I supposed to like point the marks pointer here and what is the goal I'm supposed to be solving? That's the foundation model that makes me understand what the goal is. Next is the reward model. It's like, if I succeed in doing this task, if I succeed in standing up, why should I do that? What reward do I get because I'm doing that? And the last is where I'm going to focus on today is the action representation model. Do we really think, is my brain really right now actively thinking what each one of the muscles should be doing so that standing straight is not? Right. I have this abstract, abstract understanding of what it means to be straight, and my brain can actually synthesize the rest of the details quite easily in order to do that. And that's what we are going to dig, dig a little bit deeper into, and the last two things I will, I will, I will explain a little bit more about. But the point here is the entire world, the way I see it, is called a foundational MVP. Instead of an MVP, there is a latent representation stuck in front of everything. And this is what brain does for us. Brain builds generalizable representations over extended period of experiences that we have gathered, and it presents us in a way that while you have to make this micro decisions right now, I can quickly make in a very abstract, low dimensional synthesized space rather than going all the way to the lowest level of details. Right? And I want to apologize in advance that the representation definition that I'm going to be using today is implicit representation. They're not grounded in physiological details. Probably a lot of you actually work on those final circuits, how the body patterns happen. I am not taking any of those reports today. Think of this as a black box, which has no physiological grounding. I wonder what's the difference between the actual representation and the representation from the outside network? Is there a difference between the Action representation yeah. and. Or just general representation. Yeah, so I think it's a little bit hard to directly answer this question. You, you can model a policy to anything, right? You can even ask the policy's output to be some abstract representational action, right? It doesn't have to be, for example, the hierarchical question that you ask. Maybe the policy output some kind of like a end effect or point, and you have like another kind of low level controller that's that's taking you there. So the policy can you can model it to do anything. Uh, it's your choice. Is it going to be the low level action or is it going to be some kind of compound action? Does that answer your question? Uh, but, but when you talk about action and representation, yes. just trying to figure out what it really means. Yeah, I'm going to back and go about those details. But yeah, you'll be I'll go into grand over details of those. Yes. All right. Okay, let me speed up a little bit so I can cover things. Okay, so the implication is if you can build these representations and then making decisions will be easier. And then the second, which is the beautiful part of this, is that the representations can be acquired out of the domain. And I'm going to go a little bit more into this. 
what happens is if I am actually using this mouse pointer that I've never seen before, it was provided to me over here. I did not learn from scratch how to fiddle around more of that and do all of these things, right? My out of domain experiences that I've gathered so far has given me enough understanding of the world such that I can quickly adapt my strategies to this particular mouse pointer. Right? So that's what I'm calling that most of the representation that I compared with today has been acquired out of domain for me because I've never seen this thing before. Right? And this is why most of our artificial intelligence systems struggle because we are asking them to do too much without any help. It's like dropping a module in the jungle and not even giving it to an expert. Right? It's like no one is there and then you're asked trying to figure out like, okay, you do everything. No, it doesn't work like that. And this is where parenting comes in most uh, like people who have parented or taken care of kids they are zero uh output like there is no reward maybe they're cute and that's the reward biology has big into it right but they're a lot of work you have to put a lot in order to raise an individual like we are today and that's the investment of building that representation to the point that they're capable of making great decisions from the point right so what we are going to do is be able to parent the rest of the system now so that they are capable of making the process decisions. Uh, the standard over here is going to be, I'm going to build one agent that is capable of all of these 57 tasks. Okay, that, that's what I'm going to say. I give a bunch of 57 tasks and I want one agent to be able to do all of this. And if the agent can do it, then yeah, there's some kind of generalization, there's some kind of intelligent that is in the system, right? So let me just first show you guys quickly the results and then I can go into it. So what I want you to notice is the musculoskeletal system, and you can sort of feel the weight of the wine in the glass. That is to the level of detail that they're able to like synthesize at the moment, right? Let's look at the next one. You can feel when it presses and the pressure of pressing that stamp on the table is getting captured, right? Here is torch like flashing around. Notice the pinky, how like, you know, when you are going fancy, you do like, you know. <laughs> These things are, by the way, all, Gen generative, right? We didn't provide any data. This is all optimization, figuring it out all by itself. It was shaking up the water bottle, rhythmic behavior is very hard to get because you have to go back and forth from the same state. Uh, brushing the teeth, probably something you should do. Um, and Stanford bunny, this is one of the machine learning classic thing. You know, if you don't have a bunny, it didn't work, <laughs> kind of a thing. All right, let's get into like how actually these things work. All right, Chris. Yes, sir. Do you have fluid? So we don't have, but the weight of the glass, the weight of the glass, just the yeah, British body, but the weight of the glass is off centered over there, and then you zoom. Yeah. All right, the trick over there is two step. One is get away from tasks. Okay, if you start thinking like a task, you're going to build a task solution. So we are going to put a task agnostic formulation of how to represent things. The next is going to be we are going to build those representations that are going to call behavior priors right now. And then ultimately, it's going to lead to some of these behaviors. Task agnostic formulation is going to come from something like what we know in the promotion that we anticipate movement ahead of time. And then we just only move, represent movement in some abstract way. This is where I'm supposed to go, not in terms of the rest of the body, et cetera. Right? Behavioral prior is what I'm going to build and develop. I'm going to show you how we build this thing. And at the end of the day, it leads to diverse behavior studies. All right. So, first thing, task agnostic problem formulation. What do we do over here? We act in anticipation because we are heavily underactuated in our sensory motor systems. Activity. And the only way to deal with all of these things, if you act in anticipation, you know what is going to happen, you start ahead of time. If you have to jump, you go down before, you don't start just jumping from here, right? Anticipation because my rest of the system has to keep up and build up. With uh, that regard, um, do you explicitly model beta or gamma? Systems where you can these are just black boxes of all like okay. Uh, all right. The second thing it does is basically it scales generalization because now we are decomposing the task into specification of the task, which has nothing to do with the agent, and leave objective of achieving those tasks or behaving so behavior synthesis to the agent so that that decoupling really will be helps. And because of this, that we are getting away from the task definitions. The controllers at the end, what are they going to be? They're going to prepare the agent to do things so that the agent gets all tasks. Okay, so it's preparing the agent, and that's why it's an agent centric learning paradigm or agent centric formulation. All right, the, the second thing is that if you just naively 
like take this particular approach that I told you is like task agnostic formulation and then embed in our optimization framework following things happen. I'm going to go on and show you a little bit. Most of the optimization will diverge. This is a truth based using task. Nothing you interact with the object. Even if you take control of the hammer, you throw it away, you grab the bottom the water glass, but like you have grab in a funny way. And then you have an alarm clock that you just like lose control over and you start interacting. So you, you see what's going on over there. The optimizers are trying to do the right thing, but miserably failing. The reason they are miserably failing again is that they are not working in the right representational space. So they are kind of obviously lost. They even get sometimes to the right place that they don't get lost. But if you look at humans, what's going on is even with the same object, we know when we have to grasp it from this direction, that direction, etc. And this is what we refer to as object affordances, right? How do we acquire these affordances? I don't even know what I'm going to do with these things, but how do we acquire these object affordances? There is a representation embedded in my brain that has acquired these affordances over a long period of time using off-domain experiences, my priors, that tells me these affordances are useful. Interestingly enough, that internet is full of all of these things. So what we can do is we can scrape the internet and build a representation saying like, okay, hey, give me a representation of object affordance. And that's what we do over here. That the first thing we do is bake in the object affordance back into the system, right? And if we do that, then what happens is take those affordance model, map it to the Mayo hand that I showed before, and right off the bat, it make the correct prediction. That means you are grounding yourself in the right functional space for the optimization to kick in. The optimization doesn't have to get lost and like search over the entire earth, it is dropped into the right place, this room, that this place, so I can deliver the talk. Think of it that way. So it's, it knows exactly which sub manifold is the right solution. So the scope of getting lost is, is, is very minimal, right? So the whole process works like this. The first thing we do is basically take any, any object that you care about and you specify that, like, I want this object to follow this path. That's it. I don't care. You can create this path using a motion capture data, an artist generated trajectory, or you can hand draw them, doesn't matter. The agent is not involved in the area. The next is we ask the pre draft or object affordance model to give us the affordance for this particular object. And when you hit both of them together, you end up generating the affordance. Yes. What does the pre draft look like? What, what's that affordance? So the, the, going here? the is it saying here's where each finger should go on the object? Or? This, is, this is the prediction. It basically says in order to achieve any reasonable behavior with this particular object in order and that trajectory that you have after this is a good initialization for that this is a good initialization for that this is a good initialization for that so it's instead of like think of every solution being a multi -world. i'm wondering exactly how it's parameterized like, like the output of the parameterizing you know um, the hand position of, of every joint Oh, I see. And exactly which part of the, uh, of the object or the yeah. that. So we basically give the model of this particular object that you have to interact with, let's just say this mug, and then it predicts basically the shape of the hand that is the pre grasp shape or the upward shape. So it's the starting condition. It's the starting condition. But the, uh, the network, again, starts from far out there. It just knows about something like this. That's all it knows. Right. Yeah. And, and how is this represented from your training data? Do you take the video and do some post estimation on the video, yeah. like yeah. one so second before it grasps the object? Correct. Yeah. So, yeah. like the, the output is we are showing over here. This is this is literally coming from like a vision uh, community. So the vision community has done really well these days, where you give the shape of the object from the infinite data, then they have, they can do a good prediction of how a human would grasp or pre grasp it. Right. And this pretty much comes from like what you said, object model, hand model, prediction from that. Yeah. So scraping the internet data to pick model like that. Right. This is uh, almost off topic, but uh, you can see this in action. Like the doors in the hall here, they have handles that have vertical spikes. Yeah. And people instinctively try to pull them, yeah. whether or not it's a pull or a push. Yeah. And so it's a case where the importance is not correct. Exactly. And that's that's basically the representational aspect of what it takes to make good decisions, right? So we are building representations. 
Uh, all right, fast forward a little bit. I think you guys got most of the story over here. So the way this whole thing works is basically you give an optic trajectory, a pre shape prediction that comes from those models, and then you run a standard reinforcement learning loop, and then that's that's amazing. Um, all right, that is amazing. Hey, let's see what happens, right? We can solve fifty six percent of the task with all of these smartness with without most of these smartness thirty seven percent of the task. So with the affordance model and without the affordance model, we actually learn a lot, but not, not enough. Okay. But we would really want this, this number to be as high as possible, 100%. Right. So here is basically comes in again a trick that Brian plays and what we do. We never learn one thing in our life. We learn so many things together, right? Why? Why can't I just like become a football player and not do anything else? Because you'll be miserable and being a football player you do that. And that's the trick, right? When you actually go about doing multiple things, multiple representations are getting built and updated simultaneously, and they are getting harmonized with each other. And that's the trick. Even if like you look at some of these recordings from the spinal circuits, as you grow, most of these representation gets more and more detailed. So we continually build these representations, and that's exactly what we're going to do, is build these representations. You're going to try two different things. One is called teacher student distillation, individually create all of these policies, and then all of a sudden collapse all of them at the end. All right. Each one of them trained separately, and then we collapse. Finally, with the second thing we're going to do is like simultaneously train each one of them and then get to this. The challenge here is going to be that since each one of them are easy to do because one task at a time, it is much well behaved because you can do so much easier. Because you're trying to just do one thing. Problem is, this is very bad. This is very good, but this becomes very bad. And I'm going to lie. And on the other hand, if you're trying to do too many things, this is very bad because not, it doesn't succeed in doing any of them. But when you try to reuse them, this becomes really good. And you can sort of draw the intuition is these are very isolated individual things, and they have no harmony between each other. But here there's a lot of harmony put together is too much bad. Let me expand that a little bit. I know I went too fast, but what happens at the end is if you go on the right side, you can almost start solving 100% of task. And here, each one of them individually, you can solve 100%. So instead of training task solutions that can achieve all 100%, have you a single agent that can hit all the tasks, right? And here is basically why it happens. Experts, if you look at overlap of synergies between different tasks, there is less overlap. There's literally no. If you look at the student framework, which was on the left, again, every task was learned independent to each other. So mostly they just struggle and do nothing. But on the right, since you are actually learning multiple tasks together, they are learning synergies that are overlapping. That synergy on task 10 is also useful in task four. So at the end of the day, most of the representations that you're acquiring are so harmonized that there is a good transfer between them, right? That's the beauty because then if you expose the agent to systems that can uh, penetrate one boundary from the other, all of a sudden they'll penetrate the new boundary. And that's the kind of uh, beauty that happens. So here is what uh, at the end of the day things happen. If you show things like desired behavior, it is zero shot. You haven't seen this object before in zero shot, you know that like, okay, first thing you do with any object that I'm giving you is try to probably take it up. You don't know what you're supposed to do. There's nowhere close to what it's supposed to be, right? And if you hit it with a little bit more experience and it just nails it like in five to 10 minutes, that's like more shit, right? So what it has acquired is a generalizable behavioral prior. It's, this is the basic things that you do with any object. And after that, you give it a little bit more time and it can like spike it itself. Fast forward, I think I'm going to gloss over these things in the interest of time, but very efficient system. Now we can solve a lot of different things together. I have another thing to go into, but I don't know, like, should I wrap up? Or people flexible for another five to 10. Yeah. 10, 10 more is good with everyone. Yeah, people can, and if I'm not offended, you can scout. I'm boring. <laughs> All right, so, so far what we have done is we have looked externally, right? External observations, external objects, external experiences of different things. But as you are doing those things, your body internally is also learning things about the body. 
right? Here is how I moved in order to do that. Here is how I moved. So if you learn how to drive, initially it was a lot of this and in body later internalized. I don't even think how drive I drive right now, right? That's the part we're going to go into that as we acquired all of these things, there are things that happened internally in the body. And then can we get that? Can we build those representations? And the answer is yes. So this is how the synergies emerge, that if you are using some synergistic pathways over and over, the body starts internalizing those synergistic pathways. And then later uses those synergistic pathways in order to synthesize new energy of this. All right? So hopefully everyone is familiar with synergies. I'm not going to go into details of this, but what we are going to do is we are going to learn these synergistic weights. We are going to learn the controls as the function of these synergistic patterns. And at the end, what happens is instead of directly outputting muscle activations, the network indeed learns just the weighting on these basic synergistic patterns. And instead of doing all of this in a data-driven way, where you do recordings and then find this, we are going to try to do this all automatically. Because the body wasn't given any data, the body figured it out itself. And that's what we are going to go for, right? So let's build it forward. The whole objective is going to be that we are going to initially expose you to certain set of observations or certain set of experiences. And the goal would be that you have to do it for everything else. Right? There are three different things we are going to do. Is one is we are going to build it ourselves. Then the second thing is like we're just going to expose it to a curriculum, show easier things, and then show harder things at the end. That's just the curriculum. And the end is going to be like hit it with the four full complexity all in scratch and see if you can figure it out. Right? So three different ways we are going to take it. All right, so the other two is well known. This is the baseline for us, and this is what we are building today. So that's the new part. So let's look at what the new part looks like. Okay, so what we do is we take a lot of these experiences that we have acquired, initial one, and we train a policy for these. You have a policy that, it, that, that the agent is capable of, but maybe think of like only three things have been true. So only using these three things, you have trained a policy that, that you have. And then after that, we are going to basically take the rollouts of those, those policies and we are going to build something that we call a SOG, the synergistic action representation. It's nothing but think of like an ICPCA on the trajectories that you've seen so far. So it's not going to be fancy, right? So this ICPCA space is going to be one space. And then the rest of the space is going to be your raw space. So instead of saying like, look, the hand is making decisions in very complex spaces. So far, I've told you that if you build smaller, compact representation, the search space becomes easier. So now the decision becomes easier. I'm going opposite direction now. But I'm expanding the search space even more because the hand has to make decisions in 39 dimensional space. Now the brain is making decisions in 39 plus another n dimension. And n is a synergistic pathway dimension. So instead of dimensionality reduction, I'm doing the dimensionality augmentation, which is very counterintuitive. Like I want to solve the problem, but I'm actually making things even harder for you. And this goes back to my initial problem question that I asked was, it wasn't stupid the way body was designed the way it is designed today, because that's what the body does. It provides you with these new alternative pathways that are like expressways to success, right? You use these expressways as much as possible, and when it's not possible to use those expressways, then you go resynthesize the word things. And that's basically what this model does. That this also allows you to exploit the synergistic activations. And then when the synergistic activations are not good enough, then it uses the alternate pathways. And at the end, it just sums them together and gives you that. Right? So it's basically synergistic pathways and non-synergistic pathways. You should think of synergy space and then task space. So it's a combination of these two. And when you hit the system with this, then all of a sudden, everything becomes super, super nice. Here is a quick uh, example of the three things we are talking about. On the top is what, what we are building, synergistic action representation with the reinforcement learning. The first 1 million steps, it was like random motor babbling with random optics. So we are discounting that. And after that, we are just basically training that network. And you can see how steep is the training in comparison to if you are doing basically this curriculum based learning, where the curriculum was like giving you something over here, and then you're just like uh, following on, or just end to end training, which starts to learn something and collapse because there is just too much choice, right? And this stark difference exists no matter where you look. So all of these synergistic action pathways are just giving you these express ways of making like very quick learning lessons, and that basically is the magic sauce over here. Right? And then if you train it this way, 
things generalize like crazy. So all of these bars over there are generalization bars. Others are like basically nowhere close to the generalization that we achieve. These are three different levels of generalization. It gets harder and harder as we move, right? So, you know, as you things get harder, obviously our generalization decreases, but it's still way better than any other generalization from prior to this, right? It doesn't uh, stop over, uh, okay, just quickly, maybe I can go over this. Here is the final set of the results. So now this is in hand manipulation. You know, it's known to be very complex because it's like so many degrees of freedom, so many action spaces, plus the muscle dynamics and the contact dynamics are kicking in. And here you can see the difference between the learning curves. And it's essentially like, you know, the top, which is the synergistic dimension is basically getting exploited much more and more. And then that's basically the super secret sauce that most of them. Right here is extending things to the leg the domains that you can see that we train things on basically flat ground. And you can see during the training, using the data from this policy, which actually does nothing useful, that's where we ex extracted the synergies. Right? So the synergies are not like some magical things that they already know how to solve things. No, the synergies come from like total rudimentary behavior where like you can barely take one step and it's all over. Right? So this is basically that synergy space where nothing was learned and we, we extract this uh, SAR representation. And after that, we start training and all of a sudden, all of these generalizations where the actual network has never seen any stairs, any kind of rough terrain, any kind of rolling hills, none of these were seen and all of these things emerges. Like <laughs> All right, and I think this is where I'm going to wrap up very, very fast. Um, actually, this is not at all just restricted to musculoskeletal system. We have applied it on like symbolic system as well. So these are just high dimensional control principles. And that's the beauty that understanding the mechanics of movements from a biological standpoint also allows us to move these things to other systems. And that's the beauty. I'm going to scroll through this very, very fast, but you get the idea that like even simple systems or Y systems get like significant benefit out of uh, these principles. All right, so we have pushed the boundary for another year. Time again to run the next mile challenge. Uh, again, if you guys are interested, I think you should participate. Uh, this is going to be two tracks right now. The track on the left is we are now going to understand object affordances in relation to the body, as well as in relation to the rest of the environment. So there are like uh, environmental constraints you have to specify. So that's the limit that we are going to push. The next thing is, I don't know if you guys know, but there is a word chase tag competition that happens when you're chasing individuals, right? And we are building basically a simulated chase tag where you are going to have athletic intelligence as an agility to the level that you can evade or chase other individuals. So that's the first track we are, well, first year we are going to do, but we are going to start running a world biomechanical chase tag competition going forward where we are going to actually start competing over the world. All right. Key takeaways, there are two facets of intelligence I argued about. I think one is well known, which is neural. I think the second one, which I think argued about is the, the motor control side of things. Uh, I argue that maybe we need to go away from the task-centric way of reasoning about the world. And this is where agent-centric way of reasoning about the world kicks in. I argue that maybe the way, the role the brain plays and the more fundamental role of the brain is to actually build and update these representations. Obviously, then it makes decisions on top of them, and that's what simplifies its life. Um, then we talked about generalizable musculoskeletal system, which exploited these uh, affordances uh, and via anticipation and builds synergistic activation pathways in order to make its life easier and easier. Going forward, what we are doing is we are building and trying to complete a full body model of the human. That's what we are after. We are still like my fundamental research is in the direction of building better and better algorithms. So we are improving our algorithm capabilities. Then we are partnering with about six universities today to start building like in all of these domains. But one of also one is going to be in the realm of exoskeletons and, and uh, rehab devices. And we are working with actual patients and humans in order to get some validation studies back into these results. So like your question you asked, they are not physiologically realistic. I don't want to claim it until the validation study says that, but we are seeing good results, to say the least. Okay. Um, all right, finally, the people who actually did the work. So a round of applause for them if you care, but like, you know, truly, I think the way we have built is I'm a computer scientist. I do not know anything about the details of most of these things I'm talking about. So 
people these guys have partnered and, and has helped us understand the complexity and, and over the last two years I've truly learned how complex these, these questions actually are sitting in, in machine learning and computer science lab is it's easy, but when you're hit with a real question and your real world problem, then you're not trying to start to understand there's like much more to even capturing the right details rather than just building out them. So a true appreciation from these guys. Um, most of the things that are available, if you just want to scan this thing, is up there. And I have some for weird reasons, I have a bunch of my sweet uh, uh, stickers over here. If you care about graphic one, please be my guest. And with that, thank you so much. All right, happy to take questions. I see. Yes. Um, when, when you build up the uh, synergy kind of weights, yes. uh, do you talk about what, what, what kind of time scales uh, you train on? Yeah, so uh, like, most most of the behaviors for the trajectory are the order of like seconds, so less than 10 second trajectories. It's not really long. Yeah, most of the training is like 100 million samples, if, if you know, and of course, we learn to turn it all together. 100 million samples to train the first part and extract the trajectories from that, do ICPCA on it, dig the representation, and then do another 100 million, uh, one, uh, 1 million, and then another 1 million. So 2 million, 3 million samples. Yes. So, how uh, that flow is the system, like um, you have weights that's built into the manipulation, right? But if you have actual space, then there's no weight, right? Mm -hmm. So, how adaptable is the system? In updating those kind of scenarios. Right. So the, the adaptation probably I think of them in two ways. One is zero shot adaptation. Like does the zero shot behavior is already good enough? I think we have seen some reasonable success with zero shot because I think it does reasonable things. And then we adapt the system to new situations and that's pretty adaptable, I would say. It doesn't we don't have to relearn everything. Maybe like five percent more training is good enough. Yes. Um, so the environment that you're in your I guess simple. Um, I mean, um, what success do you think if you put so your robots in a classic environment or learn from a classic environment? Right. So I think currently we are overlooking that aspect of things, right? So in a in, in any problem space, one part of it's going to be contextualizing yourself in the rest of the surrounding. So you have a high level plan of what to do. For example, if I have to run out of this uh, particular room, I might need to dodge a few things and get out of there. And then there's a second aspect of things that I know what my high-level strategy is, how do I go about actually manifesting those things in your institution. So what I talked about today with the second part, I'm completely overlooking the first part. And I think this is where the machine learning or vision community has made a lot of success that you know um, they can do high-level reasoning pretty well. But they take assumptions about low level more control or since skills or synergies being available, and we really need to come bring those things together. So you're, you're right. Like, I think most of these things are simple because we take go straight directly to the step two. The step one is taking assumptions. Yes. I mean, because it making me say our model sort of hierarchical. Uh, it seems like there's there's like really high level goals, there's like medium level goals. So yeah, that like a, for a person, the high level goal would be when I get out of balance. I need to move my support under my center of gravity. And that works for a focus stick or a bicycle or walking, yeah. although the individual motor patterns don't. They I mean, might have two levels or more levels. I don't know. 100% with you on this one. The, 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 the take that I've taken today was more implicit representations, but you can go a bit explicit and start baking either the hierarchy or even the neural structure that we have. All of those things are a fair game right now. I haven't looked at it right now, but like that's what we're talking, training about that. Like maybe you guys are the one that know the granular details of this. So maybe this is where the conversation starts. That like you tell us what the biologically inspired way of looking at these things would be, and maybe we can try it out and see if those things emerge. But like 100% with you, I do, I'm, I'm very optimistic some of those things are going to be useful. I have a question for you. Yes. So, if I'm grasping something, I go grasp it. Yes. How do you choose something? Let's say I want to know that I want to fix that. Do you just go for a good enough one or is there, like, that's a call based choice? 
Right. So the affordance, so let's let's go to the pipeline. The way affordances are built is from internet data. So first, like internet data already tells you what are the, the first few modes of any affordance with any object. So the network actually knows to predict all of those. Let's just say there are three, like you grab the carpet like this or this or maybe from the bottom. So the network knows all three of them. So if you do stochastic predictions from the network, you are going to get some distribution of all three of them. So that's one level of crowding. But the question really what you're asking is, if there are three, how do you pick between one of these three? Right. So the, the first thing, naive thing will be your first guess is your best guess and you go for that. But the second is you're also going for the object trajectory. Remember? So the object trajectory also puts a prior on the key affordance modes that you have available. So maybe that also helps a little bit in getting into the right one. Yes. One more question. Um, is do you just direct the muscle that produces specific tension? Is that analog? You can you can ask for any tension you want. Muscle. We could ask a muscle for any particular tens tension. Either we can specify directly, or we can ask the optimizer that, hey, uh, this is the nominal tension that you should maintain while solving for behaviors. We don't do any of this right now, but it's totally possible to each one of them. I just most think fly doesn't have that many neurons connected to a muscle, so it might not be able to do it arbitrarily. Yeah, so what we do at the moment is basically we penalize the activation. So there's some regularization because we want the effort to be minimized. But beyond that, we want our controller to basically go by the regular. Yes. Yes. Yeah, just uh, this one. So, so you have a 30 minute muscle in order to muscle. Right. And that actually is in a little 30 minute Correct. So then you uh, start a uh, task category, package, which is air, which is a dimension element factor of this energy. Yes. Yeah. It's energetic um, action space, which yes. is lower than 30 minute. Correct. And this are actually uh, it's a linear map, so that you yeah. go back to 30 minute dimension then you use a linear uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That that alone helps a great on Yeah, yeah. So most of the magic basically is there, isn't this? Yeah. And uh, in this pipeline, which part do you do for action representation? <laughs> so this star is the action representation. Nice. That's that that is what that's the representation. So not, not, the, not the representation of policy. Now. No, that, I'm calling that the level of policy. Yeah, so the, the SAR is basically this is what is giving you the express ways to, to do fast nice. progress. Nice. Oh, I finally understand. Thank you. And the, the policy is like you can use you can use uh, any kind of yeah, these policies are very dumb, like 64, 128 is there, so very small. Yes, the fancy part is very this. Yes, the fa everything I showed you today is very very shallow policy network. The beauty is not in, and this is what I'm saying. Like if we start putting some neural circuits or bio fire circuits in there, I think it's going to get even more interesting, right? And are they recurrent? No, not even recurrent. The speed so forward the shallow. Linear, linear feedback? Not yet, but we can model it if you have so pure Yes. Like your observations are correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, like we the, the system can model delays, but most of the, the results today is without any delays. And, and the OT including the visual inputs? No, this is only proprioception. Only a proprioception for exterioception. Since we are not using vision, we just give whatever exterioception should give you, for example, the position of this particular block and orientation of the block. So if, if, if the agent doesn't even see the object in the beginning, but the hand is very far away, yes. how does it derive a contact point? How does it, how does it so actually that's activate the point? Yeah, so that's the part of environment dynamics, but it's not necessarily observable to you. You only get to observe it from the proprioceptive feedback. So I, if I close my eyes, and I, I know roughly this is the shape. Uh, if you give me a different object from the proprioceptive feedback alone, I know what the shape is. So it uses proprioceptive feedback to understand like, you know, what's going on. In the uh, do you think it's going to be even better if the agent can actually see that? Yes. Yes. We haven't gone to that level, but I think that's, that's probably some of our next steps. Okay. And then I 
this is the only line that is very specific to the hand model, but if you just generalize this idea to even yeah, it remains to be seen how big the n should be. N is 20 right now in this piece of things. Um, so that, that's the hyperparameter that you're going to figure out like, what how big the n should be. But like yeah, we like sorry. What are the number of degrees of freedom? Uh around 22. So, so n then degrees of freedom roughly match. You could take that as a proxy. I don't know the answer, but maybe that's I guess I'm wondering, uh, you know, the robotic systems which are not overlapping. Yeah, then uh, I. How useful are is, is those dimensionality reactions? Uh, yeah, I, get, I mean, like, an excellent question. You had the same question. So I think that's where I quickly glossed over the yes. results, right? Yeah. So here, here it is basically, you know, crazy. I mean, it just, yeah, the difference is very, very strong. Uh, I think we have mostly tried it on a high dimensional system. I think your point was like maybe a low dimensional system that might be cheap down or something. I don't know if it, this would be benefit enough because the system is low dimensional enough that getting uh, SAR or any kind of like, you know, representation is very easy for the natural to acquire all that stuff. So maybe it's implicitly all implicitly already but even probably not. So in some sense, this is still over. Actually, in the sense that there's more degrees of freedom. Exactly. Yeah. That task. Correct. The subspace in which you, your task solution lies in a much narrower subspace than the full body mapping. That, that that's kind of the key uh, reason to build SAR. Is your solution manifold is very low dimensional in the whole manifold, then you should build an SAR. Are affordances explicit? Like, are you looking? If something looks like it has a handle. Yeah. The first idea is to pick it up by the handle. Correct. Right. So is that modeled in the affordances? The afford the, 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 the visual affordances, yes. The motor affordances, no. The motor affordances does not know about the shape of the object unless the motor signal starts kicking in, right? So the first few things that I showed you initially, where like we are predicting the affordance model from the yeah. shape of the object, yeah. That that visual affordance is explicit because you, you know you have this is the shape. This is the pre graph, very explicit. The, the, the motor affordances are implicit and it's just like ICPCA space that we don't really know. Really okay. Thank you. All right, I know there is a final question we had over there. And I was expecting uh, that, like, maybe it's too controversial, but I think you guys are just too nice. <laughs> No controversial take. Everyone is okay. With this. It seems reasonable, right? Okay, like, reasonable. <laughs> I'll take reasonable. <laughs> there's, there's two things to bring into it, right? You might decide to catch a ball, yeah. and then you have to do all this complicated motor stuff to actually yeah. do it. And right? those seem like two reasonable things for the brain to do. I you, uh, you know, the example that you gave is an excellent example. I don't know if, if this is well known. The way you catch a ball, like I mean, we can all speculate how we catch a ball, right? Like this, that, like you know. There are studies, the way to catch a ball is to lock the ball in your visual frame of reference. And as long as you are running or moving such that in your visual frame of reference, the ball doesn't move, you're gonna catch the ball. That is the single representation that matters when you catch the ball. It's like, are you running in a way that in your visual frame of reference, the ball is destroyed, right? That's another beautiful representation. Um, that we are capable of, and that's how it simplifies the rest of that. Okay, and here is maybe like a ending note and a take and a question. Um, let's see, what is the most complicated representation you can think of the, the, for for human body that we have? What's the most complex representation? Any any make that guess? Eyes to three D. Eyes to 3D. Yeah, that's going to be tough. That's going to be tough. Two thirds of your brain. Yeah, yes. Any other? It's not quite true in the too. Like, you have to focus such a huge amount of architecture in the brain. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, here's my questionable or like spicy take to this. Okay. The most complex representations that we are capable of is emotions. And you know, there are different definitions of emotions, but an emotional response is basically a condensed reasoning 
over your entire life, right? If you really like, if my mom is about to get hurt right now, I am not going to go pros and cons list and evaluate what she has done, she has done enough or not, so that I should save her or still harm myself. No, I don't do those things, right? This entire rationalization of that decision is condensed down into one spike of that emotion that is going to tell you if that's the right decision or choice or not, right? So I know it's very hard for people to rationalize what emotions are, but for me, maybe I'm too simplistic about this. Emotions are nothing but a compressed decision-making process that I can query as fast as possible. It's the shortest circuit that will give me the most amount of rationalization possible. That's the biggest representation I think we have. Thanks. All right, thank you all for your patience. All right. <laughs> Thank you.